And now for part two of my interview with Dr. Larry Stokes Sims, curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. Since you left the Met, do they currently have any African American or Latino curators? Uh, not African American. Uh, they do have um, a Latino cu curator, Carlos, Carlos Picon, who's head of Greek and Roman, but it's, it's sort of like an atypical casting mm -hmm. of him. And they certainly have an, a lot of Asian, you know, curators. But I think that the, you know the curatorial field in museums nationwide. We don't have to pick on just the Met. It's very hard. They're very few. And why? What are the obstacles? I think the obstacles a lot are sometimes financial. You know, when sort of kids from different communities come out of college, what their parents expect them to do and how much money they expect them to make. And you don't make that in the art field. I think that it's also uh, cultural to a certain extent. I know some younger African Americans who've gone into the field and have found it very alienating. I think that the irony is that it's really changed and we really need, and I think there'll be more people coming in. And then I think uh, very often, uh, in particularly larger museums, there's not that kind of quick turnover, too. Mm -hmm. So you have like long-standing curatorial staffs in place. Um, but, I, but I often said that, you know, the, you have things like Olga Viso, who's Cuban-American, who's now running the Walker. Tumalo Maseka, who's uh, from Africa, who's at the Brooklyn Museum, he's now at the Walker. So, but it always seems to be, you know, like in unless you're working in an ethnically focused museum or of African American art, Japanese American art, it seems to be like this kind of discrete number of, you know, like people who are there. But do you think perhaps one of the problems is the educational system? When you really look at inner cities and the public school system, I mean, looking at New York as a prime example, art programs are being slashed through our public schools throughout New York. So how can we really foster that next generation of individuals who are interested in being curators or interested in art history when we're not even giving them the fundamentals at the early age? I think you have to start at the beginning. And it's not just happening you know, in the public schools. It's everywhere. And I think that... Um, I think curating is still a mystery field. You know, people don't kind of understand it. That There are some very high-profile people who are involved, but for people to sort of really understand what that work is. I mean, even in my neighborhood in Queens, you know, my sister and I, you know, nobody ever called us by our names. They used to say, oh, you're the curator or you're the ballet dancer, you know, because it was so atypical because they expected women of our economic situation to become a teacher or a nurse or a social worker. So it's also really expanding the fields. But what I find so fascinating is that you can go into other fields and find these hidden African Americans that you don't know. Uh, for instance, the uh, NAACP has this really terrific program for high school students. It's called AXO, which is Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics. And the different uh, local chapters of the uh, NAACP have competitions in this area. And then I was invited by Leslie King Hammond, who's been working with them this year, to judge the visual artists. So in the beginning, all the judges introduced themselves. And there were all these African Americans who were hmm. meteorologists, scientists, designers for, I mean, nobody knows that the head designer, General Motors, is an African American, you know. So it's, it's really also getting the word out that we exist in these non-typical right. fields. One of the most fascinating things, I think, for, of Obama's candidacy and his presidency was to read all the reporting that was sent to me by Dwayne Phillips, my colleague at the Met where people were still trying to sort of figure out who this man was. I mean, it wasn't just Obama, you know, coming from this very strange, you know, multicultural background, but also his wife's family, you know, and the kind of distinguished spot that they had. And uh, finally, I think there was one piece that said, well, people are just, you know, they see African Americans, they think welfare mothers and rap stars. <laughs> They really don't think about the middle class, even though it has grown exponentially, particularly over the last 30 or 40 years. So we're, right. like, we're like the hidden resource of African Americans. And you have places like Ebony Magazine and Jet, but 
white people don't necessarily read those magazines. So people don't have a sense of the breadth of, of well, the African American community. Let's talk for a minute about Barack Obama, because more than any other modern contemporary president, he has spawned so much art, whether it's political art, right. philosophical uh, yes. art. What is your take on that cultural phenomena? I often think about it in terms of a, a kind of westernization, Americanization of, of African political cloth. You know, when you go to Africa and you have an election or you have a visiting dignitary, all the women come out in this Lisco cloth that has mm -hmm. white patterns and portraits, you know, like on it. I mean, we don't, you know, so we used to do that kind of with T-shirts now. But I think now he really has because he's become this global symbol. And I think that, uh, you know, the amount of images that have proliferated with him, and he's, you know, classy, he's a good dresser, he's, he's handsome, he's articulate and well-spoken. So he's really become more so than many leaders, this kind of icon mm -hmm. that is very photogenic and therefore can be transferred to different kinds of products that you can sort of wear to sort of declare your allegiance to an ideal. And I think that, you know, that's all the components for a great image in art. Something that's photogenic, it's easily recognizable, and right. it represents an ideal that you want to associate yourself with. I want to get back to something you said earlier about the fact that a lot of people don't know what a curator is. Right. This whole idea of being a curator, is it really inserting your own view on what art is? Because the use of the word curator in today's lexicon, you've got someone like Tina Brown, who's head of the website The Daily Beast. They're calling her a curator of the news. She basically takes right. the best of what she thinks is the most interesting news and curates it for you. Right. So what does it mean to be a curator? Well, I remember Dietrich von Bothma, who was the um, cu longtime curator of <laughs> Greek and Roman art. We did a, a, a program at the Met. It, I don't know if it still exists because it was probably done in the late 70s on what is a curator. And he sort of pointed out that in Europe, and particularly in England, curators were known as keepers. He says, hmm. of course, that makes you sound like you work in a zoo. But, <laughs> but essentially, that was the origins of the role. Curators were the people when, you know, in the age of the Enlightenment, aristocrats decided to open up their houses to all the townspeople so that they could get the edification of the art that they collected. The curator was the per person who made sure you had your shoes on, didn't touch anything, collected any fees, and sort of really looked after the collection, dusted it. And then it sort of evolved into, as you moved into public institutions, the curator was the person who really built the collections for the benefit of the public and sort of continued that role of creating exhibitions and defining taste mm -hmm. and sort of really, you know, helping them do it. There is, there is a kind of mark that's probably happened in the late 80s and 90s where curators became tastemakers. And I think that role, while it was always there, it's now on the forefront, so that curators almost are more important than the artists. You know, I sort of belong to the generation that sort of looks at the curators as a kind of um, intermediary between the work mm -hmm. of art and the artist and the public. So that while I have my voice, it's my, what I primarily privilege is that of the artist. But today's curators really are very entrepreneurial. They're very um, sort of personality based, and they sort of tend to want to put their mark on an artistic phenomenon. So they're or a filtering trend. the art for exactly. the viewer. But that's very much um, how tastemakers function in today's society. You think of all this, these phenomena that they used to call, you know, buzz advertising, mm -hmm. and who becomes a taste maker who do you listen how do people establish themselves as you know the person the go-to person to find out what's good so that's where blogs and right. you know all these types of communications Facebook and YouTube and all these things really come into the fore so we're we're used to having somebody mediate that for us so that we because there's so much stuff out there how can you keep track of it? well let's talk about the internet because are you concerned that with the plethora of online information about art that's out there that people are going to stop coming to museums they can see these works of art online mm -hmm. and is it going to affect turnout to museums across the country? I think there's a very uh, funny phenomenon that happens uh, when there's too much out there that's virtual. People want the real. We used to talk about this at the Met and you know certainly at the studio and it's uh, we have really incorporated 
uh, the media, you know, in, in the internet uh, at, at the Museum of Arts and Design. I mean, we have our own blog. We have our own, you know, a YouTube uh, s sort of address and, spa and Facebook space and things mm -hmm. like that. I think um, w what I found, particularly coming to the Museum of Arts and Design, where coming out of our roots in the studio craft movement, we're very committed to materials and process you know, as much as we are about, you know, theory and criticism. So what we try to do there is to sort of make the process as transparent as possible with hands-on experiences for people, either watching artists do demonstrations or through interactive films that we put into the galleries or through actual workshops that people can take. And I sort of think of museums to as an extent as the sort of antidote or the complement of the uh, internet. I mean, it can mm. be antidotal if you're sort of hostile to the internet, but the truth of the matter is that at this point we're mutually exclusive. The internet depends on museums and galleries and artists for content, and we depend on them as communication vehicles to sort of draw people into our front doors.